and the uh, preferred design. Um, you will see all of that uh, on that that 11, 11 and a half, or eight and a half by 11 um, sheet that you, you picked up at the door. Also, some of the things I, I brought today, uh, I brought a couple boards. There's one in the back. There's one in the front um, that has the step that we're, we're proposing to construct out here. Uh, and I also brought what you would see over there. I can't see it, but it's a what we call a vertical flex post bollard. Um, you, you might have seen these delineators in the past. Uh, specific, great, great um, place that, or a, a place that I think of when we have these um, bollards or safe hit sticks is um, at 106 uh, at the Love's truck stop. There's a turn lane if you're familiar with it um, that wasn't being used. We put flex post delineators there to block off that turn lane. This is something similar, but a much bigger, much robust uh, version. So I brought that and I'll, I'll get into why I brought it, but the agenda. So we're gonna go over the roundabout basics, talk about why a signal is not warranted. Uh, we're gonna go about, we're gonna look at the traditional roundabout number one. We're gonna look at the uh, roundabout number two, which is the preferred design, what we're presenting here today. Uh, and we're gonna talk about the pros and cons of each. Uh, that we're going to talk about the schedule, the estimate, and phasing, and then lifespan of the roundabout, how long we expect it to operate. Uh, and then finally, we'll go into, which I think is the, the most pertinent part, is the success stories, um, locations around New Camp, but also uh, within the district that uh, roundabouts have been implemented and the kind of uh, improvements, safety improvements that we've seen there, um, and operational improvements. And then finally, we'll, we'll close it up and uh, open, open the floor to comments. So what do roundabouts do? I think first and foremost, they reduce traffic speeds. Um, and I think everybody's experienced it going through the roundabouts on 249. When you approach it, you have no choice but to slow down. Um, and so it is a physical change in um, a, a intersection control to physically force people to slow down. Um, and uh, so that's, that's the first and foremost um, piece that we wanted to bring to the table. Uh, it forces all approaches to yield the right of way to those in the circle. It reduces conflict points between vehicles and it's, produ it's proven to reduce crash severity. So that's, that's the um, basics on why roundabouts um, have become uh, a preferred intersection control for, for VDOT. So, Route 155 and Kentland Trail, the crash history. I wanted to put this up there, so um, you know, just show what we're what we have out there. So the crash history um, is from January 1 to two of 2018 to uh, May 31st, 2022. I can't bring it to um, August because we just don't have access to that data yet. So um, that's why it goes to May 31st. There have been eight reported crashes at the intersection. Four of those crashes have been on 155 and four of those crashes are on Kentland Trail. Two of those crashes are injury crashes. One was very serious and one was considered to be uh, a visible injury. Uh, the average speed of vehicles when uh, that crash occurred uh, was 26 miles per hour. That being said, a key point is the speed differential between the vehicles. So here I'm showing the like if there was a crash between two vehicles, the first vehicle was traveling around five miles per hour and the second vehicle was traveling at 45 miles per hour. That's a huge difference um, in speed, speed differential, which is a, also why you're gonna see the average speed is around 26 miles per hour of that crash. You add those two up, 50 divided by two is 25. So, so that average speed isn't, isn't a great indication of what's actually happening, happening but that speed differential is um, is a, a great representation of what's happening with these crashes. So why not a signal? I know that was one of the questions. Um, just give me just a second. <laughs> That's really going to throw me off. <laughs> Am I good? Okay. Um, so we have this thing called the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices, the MUTCD. It's a FHWA, which stands for Federal Highway Administration National Standard. It is our Bible for traffic engineering. 
um, to put it simply. That manual states that uh, it establishes a national uniformity in the use of traffic control devices and warrants are predominantly volume based. So when we say a signal is not warranted at the intersection of Kentland Trail, what we look at is, is the volume from both the minor streets being Kentland Trail and forgive me, I don't know the name of the other side of Kentland Trail coming out of Dairy Queen. That would be the minor approach, whereas 155 um, Courthouse Road is the, uh, the major approach. So we look at volumes on both of those roads uh, and you have to meet a certain volume threshold for both the major and minor approach. So that's number one. We also look at the safety impacts at the intersection. So conflict points, signals have 32 conflict points. Uh, and that is a conflict point is when vehicles have a potential to cross paths and have a collision of some sort. Okay. So you can think about T-bones, rear end collisions, head on collisions, side swipes, all of those are considered um, uh, collision um, conflict points. And then crash frequency, fr frequency. We look at how many, uh, how often there's a crash at an intersection. But what roundabouts do is it changes, uh, the crashes at a roundabout tend to be fewer and less severe. So again, talking about those speeds, which I'll go into a little bit more when I talk about the success stories, folks are going slower. And so there may be a crash. However, when someone is going 20 miles per hour, and the other person is going 15 or 10 miles per hour, those, those collisions tend to be less severe. There is less likelihood that someone will leave in an ambulance. Typically, someone's just going to the body shop and getting their car repaired. Uh, travel delay, uh, another benefit of, of a roundabout. There's greater delays experienced with the traffic signal than a roundabout. Um, so you can imagine if you come out of Kentland Trail and you're sitting there want to make a left, uh, there may be nobody coming, but you have to wait for that signal to actually turn green for you to go. So a great thing about a roundabout is you pull up, you check, you see if there's anybody coming. No, you pull into the roundabout, you go around the circle and you're, you're on your way. So, so those are some of why we, we have um, started utilizing roundabouts more and more uh, throughout the Commonwealth. So this is the, uh, what we call a traditional roundabout. It is just a standard circle. Uh, there's nothing um, wonky about the shape, uh, but it, it goes right there in the center of the intersection um, and all traffic would be uh, filtered into that lane and then into the roundabout, uh, you'd have to yield to traffic coming in, in the direction to your left. Uh, so that, that's a traditional um, design roundabout that we looked at. This is a more detailed version of that. It shows kind of where the signs would be. And again, uh, I didn't bring, I didn't bring a board for this, but this is, uh, we did look at a design for a traditional uh, and conventional style roundabout. All right. So, uh, some of the pros for, uh, the conventional style. Well, number one, it's conventional. So even if folks are not necessarily for the roundabout, I, I would put money on that every single person in here has at least driven through a roundabout once. So it's nothing necessarily new. Um, so that is a pro, it, it is conventional. Uh, number two, it maintains dedicated right turn lanes for northbound 155 and westbound Kentland Trail, which tend to means that it will operate better. So what I'll do is uh, I will go back and show you what I mean. Forgive me, I'm not gonna use the, uh, the mic. So right here, you will see that there's a line. This is what we call a slip lane, a dedicated right turn lane to come out of the roundabout. So you don't actually, it's basically what is out there today. So this traditional roundabout allows us to do that. Same thing down here. We have the slip lane coming northbound into Kentland Trail. There is no slip lane going southbound or coming uh, back this way, which would be eastbound. All right, so, so those are some of the, pro, the pros. Some of the cons, it requires demolition to the existing curb along Kentland Trail and Chesapeake Circle. 
there's the name of that road. Um, however, it does increase a little bit of confusion. It can lead to more minor crashes, 12 comp conflict points versus a traditional, I say we call this a traditional. When you add the slip lanes in, you're actually introducing new conflict points. So a traditional signal has eight conflict points. Um, but the, this version that we're showing actually has 12 because you're adding those slip lanes. So I would call that it, it does increase, it proves uh, the operational efficiency. However, uh, more chance for crashes, more trans chance for fender benders, in a way can almost um, negate some of those operational improvements that we see. Uh, and then it increases the quantity of safe hit bollards. So um, now I'll real quickly talk about how we're going to use these bollards. As Mr. Steer said, this is, we're proposing a temporary roundabout. This is not the end all be all. This is something that we would like to have constructed within the next few months. So instead of using your traditional truck apron, concrete apron in the center, we are proposing to delineate it with those bollards over there. Um, we are going to put them in the circle here, delineate the circle, and then we'll paint another circle on the outside of that, and then we will strike it um, to delineate that truck apron. So that's why I brought the bollard. Um, it's a way for us to, to complete this project very quickly, get it on the ground, um, and, and see how it operates. And then in, in time, we work together to fund a, a, a full permanent roundabout. All right, so, so that's traditional. This is the proposed. This is what we would like to do. Notice one thing we're doing, we're eliminating those, those slip lanes. We're getting rid of them because it improves the safety um, factor, or the, the safety in the roundabout, because you have those fewer conflict points, but also, frankly, operationally, it doesn't need the slip lanes. It's a, it's a little icing on the cake, but it is not needed. The biggest key for this design roundabout, and we're calling it the peanut, is that it can all be done within the existing right of way. There is no demolition to the existing curb. There's no widening of the road. So it's quicker, it can get it in the ground, on the ground faster. Um, and, and frankly, I think it's less confusing. This is again, a more detailed uh, design. And I, uh, so these have the signs that um, would be associated with the roundabout, uh, some of the, the interstate signs, as well as the, um, the yield and um, lane assignment signs. So some of the pros of the peanut roundabout, it can be completed within the existing asphalt footprint. So I mentioned that decreases confusion. So there's fewer conflict points. Again, this is, has eight conflict points, whereas that other one with the slip lanes has 12. There's less safe hit bollards that we need. And uh, a con is you lose those dedicated uh, turn lanes and then it's different. It's just different, uh, which, which can be, uh, it can be a, a con, but it can also be a pro. It can be the, the first peanut roundabout in the state of Virginia right here in New Kent County. So, um, you know, it depends on, depends on which way you want to look at it. So that's up for, uh, that's a judgment call. All right, so schedule. I know this is probably incredibly interesting to everybody here. So we think that this project can be done in five weeks. Um, phase one, we would like to start it in September. Phase two, that would be in early October. Phase three, middle October. And we expect to be done by Halloween. That is our, that is our goal. A standard construction project, so a traditional three-phase project that's going to be a put a permanent roundabout out there can typically be a five to six year 
project with three to four years of project development and a year to two years of construction. So we're talking about a really, really accelerated schedule. Estimate, there's three major material items. Asphalt, we have to replace the existing asphalt out there. Absolutely have to. Number two, have to restripe the road, which is a huge reason why you have to repave it because the existing markings are just gonna be confusing and in the way. So you have to remove them. And then what we're calling the K71 safe hit bollards, which again is over there on the counter. Expected costs around $300,000. So uh, a traditional roundabout um, is somewhere north of two million, around two to three million dollars. Phasing. So again, new asphalt. There's a significant amount of asphalt that needs to be replaced. So that's going to be first and foremost we got to do. Number two is using barrels to delineate the new traffic pattern. So the roundabout. So this is an awesome opportunity for us to just take barrels, you know, set out the circle and allow folks to just run through it for a week, two weeks, and see if there's something that needs to be tweaked prior to us putting the permanent center island in the asphalt. So we're looking at about a week to two weeks, and we'll use message boards to, um, to, to inform traffic of the new traffic pattern. Part three is going to be, or phase three would be the striping. So that's putting any new striping on the pavement after we've determined exactly where that new circle is going to go. And then last but not least is we will install those safe hit delineators, um, which has a, an anchor. Uh, you drill a hole into the asphalt, you put an anchor in there and it gets epoxied. And then you take the safe hit bollard and I'll just go grab it. See, there's a bolt right here that actually gets turned into the asphalt and it stays solid. And if you look on the inside, it is hollow. So if you hit it, it is gonna, you're gonna run over it. All right, so the expected life cycle for the roundabout. We believe that this roundabout can survive five to seven years. Um, obviously, we'd want to get a project, a permanent roundabout done as soon as possible. But, um, you know, going through the, the design, right of way, moving any kind of utilities, all of that could take four to five, six, seven years. So we believe that this roundabout would be sufficient for, for around five to seven years. Ultimately, it's our commitment as VDOT to continue to work with New Kent County um, to figure out a way to fund a full permanent roundabout um, at this intersection. Again, the big, the big issue here is the amount of money that a, 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 a standard roundabout costs, a, a traditional truck apron um, roundabout is gonna cost. We have to identify that, that funding together. All right, so my favorite part is the success stories. This is uh, one of your neighbors over there in Chesterfield County. This is Otterdale Road in Hampton Park. You can see in, in certain ways, it's similar to Kentland Trail. There is a lot of turn lanes. Uh, there's a lot of through lanes, just a lot of asphalt and a lot of decisions to be made. And there was quite a few crashes. So another piece of this is Otterdale Road is 45 miles per hour, very similar to, to 155, and there was a speeding issue. So the crash history, three years prior to the modification, there was 18 reported crashes, seven reported injuries, and 15 of those crashes were angle crashes, meaning uh, a vehicle hit another vehicle in some kind of perpendicular um, motion. This is after the fact. This is what we called a modular roundabout. So a little bit different than what we're proposing. 
um, and it's a little bit more permanent. Uh, I think the expectation is that this roundabout lasts longer than five to seven years. But you can see the same concept was applied. A lot of that additional asphalt that was there has now been striped out and um, cannot be used to the traveling public. It funnels everybody into a single lane. So, you know, you see this and you think that, wow, that intersection needs two turn lanes, one a left, one a right uh, from either direction and it needs two through lanes. Well, honestly, this is operating perfectly fine and it is a single lane in either direction. There is no slip lanes. There's no turn lanes. It is just a one lane entering the roundabout and it's operating beautifully. So some of the crash history after the fact, 22 months, this was built about, about two years ago. Um, there have been seven reported crashes. There have been zero injuries. Seven of those crashes were considered angle crashes. However, all were property damage. The average speed prior to the crash was 16.6 miles per hour. And the speed differential, as I talked about earlier, tended to be more around 25 miles per hour and 10. I saw some speed differentials in the, uh, the crash report that said that it was 15 and 10 or 15 and five. So it effectively reduced the speed that people are, are driving the, uh, the intersection, but also um, when they're colliding with another vehicle. And frankly, there's been fewer crashes. All right, we're gonna see if we can get this thing to work. Keep in mind, this road is 45 miles per hour. And these folks are not going 45 miles per hour. This roundabout has done its job by slowing folks down. It's easier to make decisions, safer, operationally, works beautifully. And I'll just let it run through. Okay, so that was Hampton Park in Otterdale. All right, so this is another one done in Chesterfield County. This is, uh, like I mentioned, the flex post delineators. Uh, these are a, a different version than what we're proposing to use here. This is a bigger, more robust version. But similarly, an intersection that had, was operating fine for, uh, the first few years that it was, it was open. And then the fourth leg opened and um, additional traffic started to spill in and they started having a bunch of angle crashes and like one every week, it was quite a few. And so how do we mitigate that very quickly? Um, and so the folks in Chesterfield use these safe hit delineators. We're gonna drive through it. This is from a point of view Similar situation, funneling everybody into a single lane, slows you down. Into the roundabout. Folks are moving slowly. And there we go. Pretty easy to transition back to those that multi-lane um, to here. All right, so I wanna talk real quickly about some of the new Kent County roundabouts. Uh, this crash data, again, was pulled from January 2018 to May 2022. The first one, 249 and Tunstall Road, 612. There have been eight reported crashes zero reported injuries. All of those crashes have been uh, deemed to be property damage only. So no injury crashes that are occurring here at this roundabout. Next one is 249 at 106, so Emmaus Church Road. There's one reported crash, one reported injury. That one 
the driver was traveling at an excess rate of speed, 65 miles per hour. So, I, you know, there's not much you can do when someone is, is you know, breaking the law in that capacity. I've reviewed the, uh, the crash report for this particular crash. I believe it involved five different vehicles. There was four vehicles getting ready to enter the roundabout or three, and the, the person came up, hit the uh, first car in the rear, and it shot everybody across the intersection and collided with someone else that was coming to the intersection. So granted, I think five vehicles were involved in that crash and only one, there was one injury. So, so that's, that's everything I have. That's what I was uh, planning to present to everybody. Um, more than willing to open it up to uh, questions and, all right, so we, we got hands. Appreciate you guys being patient. Yeah, if you guys will raise your hand and we'll pass, pass the microphone to you. With this um, proposed roundabout, how do you project that's going to work since you've got a business on one end of it versus these other roundabouts are just roadways and it gets very congested uh, across the street. So what's your experience with that or do you have anything like that? Sure. And you're talking about the, the Dairy Queen. Dairy Queen, sure. the uh, Exxon, the convenience center. You have restaurants over there, real estate office, all sorts of stuff. Sure, I, I think that's a great question. Uh, sure, so I will ask that my district traffic engineer help me, but the question was, um, how do we expect the roundabout to operate uh, with businesses there on the West End, including the Dairy Queen, I think you said a real estate office. Um, And that's, Thank you. Um, that's one of the considerations we take into account. I can talk loud enough for everybody. <laughs> that's one of the considerations we take into account when looking and considering roundabouts. Typically, um, they can they can handle about twenty five thousand vehicles a day. So but that's and that's for a single lane roundabout. So we do we do look at the capacity and the volume and the demand for the side streets, um, and that had gone into this analysis and this decision making to make sure that we could handle that kind of traffic. Local law enforcement, what is their opinion on these proposals? So I, I, I'm not sure if Sheriff McLaughlin is here or not. Um, we, have, we have presented this to Sheriff McLaughlin um, and he has been uh, receptive to it. Uh, I don't wanna speak for him. However, I will say that he has not come to us and said, no way, heck no. So, but I, I think that is something that he should have the opportunity to to answer for himself. You all had stated that there wasn't enough traffic to merit a traffic signal. And your study was done from 2018 to 2022. Since that time, I mean, during that time, there was no racetrack here. So you lost all that traffic that is being generated now. And we haven't even seen the full extent of it yet because racing season is really just beginning. Um, the other thing too, is we've added another 200 plus homes in this community that that traffic really hasn't generated itself yet because a lot of these residents have not moved in yet. So I'm concerned that the volume of traffic that you all show in your study is not correct to the day's traffic. Plus I'm also a little bit concerned with the regard to you have an awful lot of large vehicles coming into this community. You have dumpsters coming in. You have log trucks coming in. You've got cement trucks coming in. You've got a place in the back here where people have their boats and their RVs. And you've got a lot of lawn services that are always hauling trailers. 
So I'm not sure that this roundabout peanut or otherwise actually does justice to those large vehicles. Well, I'll answer the the geometrics and the size of the roundabout first, and I'll let Mr. Felak handle the uh, the um, volume of traffic. So we are we are designing it for a horse trailer, the the large uh, commercial horse trailer that we would expect to be coming into um, the uh, heading to Colonial Downs. Um, so that that has been taken into account for our design. Um, additionally. These bollards, they're going to act as a truck apron. So they're going to be the center of the roundabout. And then, like I said, there's going to be striping on the outside of it. So you can imagine that that striped out area is going to be a safe place for those trucks to track over if they are too large to um, go into the actual uh, the dedicated lane. And that dedicated lane, um, I believe we're designing it to be around 17, 16 to 18 feet wide. So additionally with that four or five feet of striped out center island um we we've shown that those trucks can navigate um safely and um in addition to that like uh, like philip said for the design vehicles we had also that truck apron is also laid out for one of the biggest semi trailers that we have in our in our design standards so we'd be able to get um it's it, you know, typical interstate tractor trailer around that roundabout as well. Um, so if they were you know, going to the, the gas station, making deliveries there, they'd be able to easily get around there um, using that truck apron and return back to the interstate. Um, as for the volumes, we did we did look at we did pull, um, do some volume uh, data collection prior to COVID. Um, we haven't done any since because since COVID, all of our volumes have been uh, relatively skewed, um, typically lower. Um, but we did look at it, the, uh, I believe it was the, uh, not, not the, was it the summer before COVID? I believe it was 2018. 2018. So we did look at um, that summer during um, when the, the track was active during those periods. There were events, we counted specific event nights for the track when they were going on. There's more going on the track now than there was then because you do have the casino operating. And Rosie's was, was operating, operating at the time we did counts. So we did, and that was, I think it would, I think that was the year it opened or reopened. Um, 18? 18. 2018. Yeah. yeah. So it was, the, it was August of that year when we, when we looked at the counts. Um, so we did, we did try to take into account some of the peaking of the of the operation of the site and the, and the additional facilities that are involved with not just the neighborhood but also uh, the racetrack. Um, and again, the, the, we we did look at this from an operational standpoint, using those volumes and projected them out through to um, I believe this one was 2040. So we looked at the volumes projected out that far to see if with that growth would this still work, and with that growth we still saw. Um, some pretty good operation uh, with the roundabout without significant delay, significant queuing. And if I may add to that, I spoke with Fire Chief Rico Pat this afternoon uh, on some other matters. He is in full support of the roundabouts. We already have four in the county, and our fire engines have had no problem maneuvering through any of them. We even have a huge, um, like, 38-foot ladder truck. And he said they have no problems maneuvering through them. Just to add that to it. Thank you. Yeah, I, I can hear you. So um, we chose the peanut for a couple reasons. Um, a, we believe it's it's less confusing because you remove those uh, those additional slip lanes. Um, number two, and maybe the biggest factor was there's no impact to the existing infrastructure, so demolishing or demolishing the uh, current um, median curb on Kentland Trail and on Chesapeake Circle. Uh, traditional roundabout, we would have had to do uh, some extensive demo um, to fit it in. Follow-up question is that 
there is plenty of room on this side uh, for traffic to back up. There's plenty of room on Courthouse Road for traffic to back up. But there is no room by the stores for traffic to back up. So as traffic goes around their little roundabout and come out of the stores and line up there, sometimes I've seen as many as eight cars lined up there. And if you've got the traffic at five o'clock coming from work or whatever, they are never going to get out of here. I just, and where are they going to back up to? Where is the traffic going to go to? Because it's right now, it's just blocked. It looks like someday they're going to go back further. Yeah, if I could, if I could take that one. Um, so, I mean, the, the roundabout is going to be a very, a very different operation than what's out there today. Um, you'll the the traffic coming out of the the commercial site will only need to deal with one direction of traffic and gaps in that one flow of traffic. Once they enter the roundabout, traffic on one, northbound 155 would need to yield to them. So they'd be, Philip mentioned that early on, it's, it's yield on entry. So traffic in the roundabout has the right of way. So once they get in, they would have the right of way to complete their movement. <clears throat> so someone coming from the freeway entering the roundabout, they would have to go through the roundabout and then they would have to go through the roundabout and then they would have to go through the roundabout and then they would have to go through the roundabout and then they would have to go through the roundabout they would, uh, if there is someone in the roundabout, the person in the roundabout has the right of way over the entering vehicle. But once that vehicle passes, then this person can enter. And then this person would have the right of way over this loop. But once there is a gap in that, they would be able to come out. So they're exiting here. You're not, you're not competing with two directions of traffic. You're only looking at one, one direction at a time. heavy traffic coming south off the interstate into the circle. And so if you're coming from the store, you're really going to have a chance to get into that circle because of the heavy traffic coming off the, off the interstate. And that happens a lot during the rush hour period when people come in to work. At the same time, there's race events going on. So my question to you is the traffic studies you did I'm assuming you did the traffic studies include volume. Yes. Are there also peak volumes that are assessed in that as well? Right. Our analyses are based on a morning and an evening peak period. So we, we do counts over the period of a whole day, and then we take the two worst hours and analyze those. So my other related question to that is, are there any plans to reduce the speed limit uh, on approaches to the circle? Because people coming off the interstate are coming off the 75, 70 miles, 75 mile an hour speed limit. They're going to jump off 45, and it's going to be 55 coming to that circle. And that's not looking for dangerous situations. And in other, I mean, we, we do have some at the end of interchange ramps where um, this, we, we have not lowered the speeds on any roads when we introduce a roundabout. Typically, that serves to slow traffic down. Just with the visual cues and um, the the more the, the higher visibility of the intersection, but um, in Virginia we do have some at the end of interchange ramps or in close proximity to interchanges. And to my knowledge, I, mean, I know in our district we don't have any that um, we've lowered speeds and have not seen um, significant issues with high speed of, you know, high speed traffic coming up to these roundabouts without changing their behavior. So they, they typically do change behavior. And I, think, I think to add on, going back to this particular example over in Chesterfield, Otterdale is 45 miles per hour, similar to Kentland Trail. And I believe we were getting, um, we were getting speeds of upwards well of 50. well 50 over 50. So very similar where we were seeing a speeding issue. And again, I'll just, I'll play it, but you can see that we didn't change the speed limit at this intersection at all. It is still 45 miles per hour and yet they, this is what folks are doing. They are slowing down because they are physically made to slow down to enter the roundabout. Oh, yes. 
So yeah, this this is a this is, this is the the residential areas behind here are just about fully developed, and it's um, significantly larger than the Brickshire neighborhood. Um, also, this way is north. There's a there's a YMCA right over here in this corner. You can see this uh, this basin. Right over here is a, um, a relatively new Wawa, and just off the map up here is Hall Street Road, which is US 360, a very heavy commercial corridor through Chesterfield County. Um, and this connects it back through, in, it's a connector road to other roadways and neighborhoods that serve Southern Chesterfield County. So this does carry a significantly greater amount of traffic than what we're seeing at, um, at Courthouse Road and Kevin Trail. I've been on that roundabout. The only thing I hate about that roundabout is the yeah. 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 You come into the famous black area, so I guess we're going to have like these things on it. Yeah. They're going to be with the reflectors on. So the, yeah, this this. That doesn't happen. Correct. Sure. Yeah. I think it has a few of the, the the thin narrow ones in the ion, but these do these create a much more visual impact for the intersection. And, um, and it will it will be white on white for the edge lines and yellow on yellow for the center island in this in the uh, the median. Yes, yeah. this is retro reflective these two, tape. These two pieces right here. No, no, they are not lit. Okay, you guys, let me remind you: if you're going to speak, please have the microphone for the our audience at home. That if you don't have the microphone, they can't hear you. Please when wait to get the microphone. So when the headlights hit these, these will light up at night. I have basically the speed question in that um, on 155 coming from Providence Forge, it's an uphill grade. Unlike your video, they will not see the circle, okay? And they will probably not see those unless they're 10 feet tall, okay? Because many of the tractor trailers hauling logs start accelerating and the 45 mile an hour speed limit does not occur until you reach the turn lane to turn into Kentland Lane. Okay, I'm just saying if you do not move the 45 mile an hour speed limit at least half a mile back, you're going to run into problems with tractor trailers jamming on the brakes because they're coming up an upgrade and they're going to accelerate because they can go 55. Okay, I'm just expressing that. The other thing is that. Um, on the, you, you call it Emmis Road, which is uh, 106 and 249 at the Kenlin, uh, the farmer's market in New Kent. That has the slip lanes, which are divided lanes. That is a much better situation, especially for large volumes of traffic than a peanut by any, any stretch of the imagination. So I'm just expressing a concern over that kind of, you're taking essentially a four lane highway, necking it down to one lane or two lanes, necking it down to one lane to go into a turn. The other thing I would like to bring up is the turn at, you say Tunston Road, uh, Road and it's Airport Road. That turn, that size is not big enough for a tractor trailer. I've had to stop and actually pull off so the tractor trailer could make it around the turn. Your option two is making a tractor trailer go way out. It's going to hit those ballots, okay? Not just horse trailers, I'm talking tractor trailers, okay? And I know the one at Airport Road is not sized correctly. I don't know your dimensions that you've measured, but go measure that one. And if the peanut one is that size, I do not believe the tractor trailers will not damage equipment. So, so I'll, start, I'll start there first. One of the things that we're doing with the phasing is we are going to use barrels to set up the, that inner circle first. Um, that's going to really help us see what does get hit. So prior to taking these safe ballers and putting them in the ground, we're going to see where does the circle, we've got a design, but where does the circle really need to be to not get constantly hit by the So, so I was talking about the phasing, and um, we're going to use barrels to kind of set up the roundabout prior to permanently putting these in the asphalt. Uh, that's going to really give us a, a trial run prior to, to doing this, see where 
um, these need to go permanently. So that's number one. Number two is uh, you mentioned not being able to see the bollards in the inner circle. We are going to use these coming down a significant portion of the median in, in, um, on Kentland Trail. So, right, so, so yes, we are going to put these on 155. So it's gonna look like this going through the median. So you will see it, you will approach it. There will be yellow on the, on the center line and there will be white on the edge line. And sorry, just bear with me. So this is 155 where you're talking about coming from the interstate. So, yeah, so, so, okay. So, You cannot see, even when you're pulling out now, you may not even see a Tesla, a low level car, okay, until it starts pressing the hill in the intersection. So, and, and again, so what we'll do is we will have these delineators coming south too. So it will be funneling. Either way you want to look at it, yes. If you're coming, if you're heading north, there will be delineators, vertical post delineators as you enter the roundabout, and it'll go back, say, two or 300 feet or so. And so it's going to funnel everybody in, which is just naturally going to force folks to slow down. Um, we are also going to be signing um, the approaches in all directions to let folks know that you are approaching a roundabout. Um, so, I, you know. Sure. Yes, um, the project before us, as you said, is a temporary project that you're getting ready to install. Is the permanent already decided that it's going to be permanent, or is this a trial and error that you can collect data and let us know exactly what should be there, if it should be there or not, as some of these questions are being raised? Are we going to do another statistical data collection and then come back and talk to the community before we go forth with the permanent, or is it already permanent? And once we start, that's what you're gonna live with. I think that's incredibly fair question. And I, the easy answer is no. I think if, if we put the peanut in, and for whatever reason it fails catastrophically, we are not going to, to force a permanent roundabout in there in that design. would be great to have as it applies to what data is collected and what is the outcome. Of course, we're going to know because we're going to be talking about all the wrecks and whatnot that happens, but we'll know that. But as to your data collection and what your decision is, will we have another conversation so that we'll know exactly what we're looking forward to? Yeah, we, we can commit to coming back after this has been implemented and, and come back with hard physical data about what we've seen in the last year or maybe maybe a year and a half, give us time to really collect um, you know, quality data. And we have no problem coming back and having that conversation again. Uh, right. And that, that, so that was gonna be, so I, I'm, I'm gonna tell you. <laughs> so so that's, that's just with this temporary, that's my commitment for the temporary project, we'll call it. But for a permanent roundabout or a permanent project in this, at this intersection, we will have a public involvement phase. We will have a, a um, official public hearing. Um, this is a town hall meeting. We will have an official VDOT public hearing, collect comments, uh, take that into account before we finalize any design. So, so that is absolutely, there's two, two answers to that question. Yes, I'm more than happy to come back to, to this room right here and, and do a, a, a learning, you know, after action um, review and see how it's operating. Um, but in the meantime, with that, that permanent project that gets funded, there will absolutely be a public involvement phase. 
Two things I'd like to hear. I think you touched on one of them. Did I understand you're going to have uh, approaching roundabout signs on the courthouse? Yeah. And if there were, if those were well in advance of the line of sight of the roundup roundabout, that'd be great. Uh, the other concern is uh, physical work start date. I'm assuming that's after the track is closed. That is correct. So, and to answer your question about signage, we are showing up here, you'll see the green signs are very large um, signs uh, showing that you're about to enter a roundabout. And I believe those are somewhere around 48 inches by 60 inches. So four foot by five foot, they're large. Um, and then there will also be uh, additional signs approaching the intersection uh, to funnel you into uh, the lane. And then also uh, yield signs right there in the center of, of the roundabout. So quite a bit of signage, quite a bit of striping. So go ahead, sir. Yeah, just a quick comment. I don't know if it's within the scope of what we're looking at for the roundabout here, uh, but uh, my uh, uh, enduring concern, uh, and it just happened to me again yesterday uh, evening, is uh, vehicles coming out of the uh, Chesapeake Circle complex, right? Coming out of the Dairy Queen, coming out the indoor right? Uh, they're coming out the, the furthest south portion of the parking lot right there, and they're coming out. Now, I see you've redesigned that to an extent, kind of extended uh, that, that uh, triangle bit there. Uh, my concern is with the roundabout in the intersection, right now, vehicle came out, uh, it made it out uh, uh, the gate there and started coming up, and there's two of us coming in at the same time. So they skirted off to the left of us and headed on out. Quite often, they're already out almost to the road, and you've got vehicles flying up 155 coming in. They can't go that way. We're coming across, you know, coming through. What I see developing there with a the roundabout is a pinch point where they're coming out. There's not as much maneuver room anymore to avoid an accident. It's actually created a pinch point for that. I don't have the answer on how to re-engineer that Chesapeake Circle. It's a hot mess with the roads going every which way, you know, partially closing it off, you know, redesigning that uh, to eliminate that that hazard is my concern. That's that's a great point. I'll be honest, I don't know that we have the answer to that right now, simply because this is a this is actually a private entrance. Um, and we don't maintain it, so we're a little limited of what we can and can't do there. But, but I think that's a really valid point that we definitely need to go back and, and see how we're going to mitigate that possible conflict. Thank you. I have yes, a question, question here uh, regarding the slip lanes. I'm in favor of have, leaving the slip lanes there, even temporary for now. I mean, even what's out there, if you make the right turn, it actually works pretty well. And that's just like temporary bowers. We make a right to go to the highway. And that's something that stops. Yeah. <laughs> But um, anyway, I guess my, um, I mean, even like at uh, 106, that, that circle seems to work pretty well. Um, like there's a circle down at um, Hilton Head Island gets a lot more traffic than us, and that just keeps moving with slip lanes as long as you have the curbing between it. So I'd recommend the slip lanes with the curbing. But I guess my question for you would be, I, I don't understand how if you have slip lanes, it adds contact points if you have curbing between it, because there's cars in the right lane, they're making rights and not even getting in the circle. So, good question. Um, yeah. Sure, if you want to. So, um, where, the conf where the conflict is in the, with those vehicles, um, even though they're, they're separated on entry, when they get into the roundabout, you'll have two vehicles side by side, and there's a potential they could cross paths in. Well, you wouldn't have curbing through the interior of the roundabout. Oh, right. And in this instance, even if we had the bollards um, along, along that lane line, when they enter here, someone could, someone still could conceivably come up in this lane, be like we were talking about, um, make the wrong decision and also turn right. See, and the same thing with this approach over here. They're separated on, on the entry, but they could still, someone could be coming around the roundabout and still want to go over into that lane. 
So one of the big things that we want to do with a roundabout is just reduce the amount of decisions that you have to make as a motorist. And, and that's what a single lane roundabout does. You have, you have one decision to make, and that is to enter the roundabout safely when, when no one is coming from your left. So, Okay, my question is going to be logistics. So when this starts, we at Brickshire are a community with one entrance and one exit. What's it going to do to us? when this starts, because the paving was really a nightmare. Um, but we got through that. How long is it going to be a disruption where we are having to, we can't get out? So we'll, we'll always maintain traffic so that it can get in and out, um, number one. Uh, number two, I think there's definitely an opportunity for us to do a lot of night work um, to impact fewer vehicles. Uh, but, but to answer your question, we will, we will not lock anybody in. Yes, sir. You know, I come from New Jersey where we were getting rid of roundabouts instead of adding them. And one of the reasons why we got rid of roundabouts, we learned as in other states, becomes a game of chicken. And that's what I see happening here. It became a chicken who has a right of way. I know the manual says whoever's in the roundabout has a right of way. But anyway, forget that for a minute. You said the traditional roundabout is a lot more expensive and you'd have a lot more repair work to do. That's worst case scenario. If this peanut roundabout doesn't work and you start destroying bollards left and right with these big rigs coming by and people not making the turns and these bollards are being ripped out and you still have accidents, do you ever revisit a traffic light? Will you, and how much does a traffic light cost compared to the traditional one where you have a lot of more construction? Um, yes, yeah, so I mean, if, if the, when we, when we do come back and reevaluate this, um, if the roundabout is not working, we would, of course, we're gonna be collecting the new traffic data. We'll be comparing that traffic data to, again, the, the, the aid warrants that Philip mentioned earlier. Um, to see how it compares to the thresholds. Um, a signal can be considered if we meet, the, if we meet those volumes. So uh, if, this, if a roundabout doesn't function properly here, um, that's, you know, it is something that can be reconsidered. Um, it is a, a, you know, a little, bit, little bit of a process to, um, to get that approval. Um, and typically those are, I mean, these days, um, all, of our, all of our material prices have gone up. So we're probably seeing somewhere around six to seven hundred thousand dollars, <throat> right? To just to do no work other than drop a signal error. And just for 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 frame of reference, I'm also from New Jersey, <laughs> so I I was a uh, <clears throat> spent about thirty seven thirty eight years there, um, and lived um, along the down the down the shore. So I'm very familiar with the, the circles that were down there. Um, they, they, they have a very different operation than these that we're proposing. Those, the main road always had the right of way. And yes, um, they would constantly lock up all summer long. You would never be able to move. That's one of the beauties of this is they call it a continuous flow intersection because the center circle is always moving. So once you get in there, as long as there's a gap in traffic, Nobody, no, no road has right of way over, you know, we're not, today, uh, Courthouse Road has the right of way over um, Chesapeake and Kentland Trail. <clears throat> Everyone will be considered the same in a scenario like this. First of all, I want to say good evening to everyone. Good evening. Now, I've been traveling on this road at 150 in the Kenton Trail for 11 years, so I know what's going on with the traffic. I'm from the city, from Washington, D.C., so we don't believe in roundabouts either. And so when I look at this situation, uh, the area is going to grow in that section right there. And a light will probably be the answer in the long run. You know, a four-way light probably flashing. You can have them flashing red, flashing yellow on, on different points of the day. And, um, but I don't see a roundabout in that area. I just don't visualize it. 
because that, that's a very busy uh, intersection. And it is a fight coming out of the uh, community to try to get over to that gas station. It's a fight. And, um, and I, win, I win a lot of times getting over there. But, you know, but still the fact that the, we need a light there. I, I'm, I'm for the light. And the court is at, I mean, this, this uh, roundabout, I don't know, I'm not sold on it yet. Now, I got a second question. Um, is, is the widening of the streets on um, Route 150 South, um, 155, I'm sorry, <laughs> I made another route. Uh, is the widening of the, of the route on 155 South part of the main feeder Harding program? Are you familiar with that? Which program was that? The, the main feeder hardening program. Are, are, are you working with them? Because the, the, the roads are widening up. It's, it's a good deal because now you, you don't have to worry, worry about going into the ditch. You know, at first, you know, trucks come down there and you can't, you, you don't have no room. So now it's, it's better. I got to say VDOT scored on that. Now, also, um, on our main drive going into our community, uh, Brickshire, the roads are bad. I know VDOT owns a road. We can't do nothing about it. If, if, if your company can come down and repave their road because it's bumpy and patchy, it looks bad. It's, it's bringing down our community. And um, you know bad roads bring down the, the prices of your home. So if, if we can get that done, if this, if this roundabout is accepted, while you're working on the roundabout, just take, take the machines right on down the road. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's a fair enough request. Um, one, one piece that I just want to circle back on, because you said you, it's, it's fight to get out. Um, and I imagine that a, a big reason is because of the speed of, of vehicles that are coming from either direction on 155 um, and, and having to look both ways. Well, that's, again, that's the beauty of the roundabout is you're forcing people to really slow down and you are only looking in one direction to the left. So, that's that's just that's the beauty of the roundabout. That's how it, it physically slows vehicles down. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, my concern is the 64, that uh, interstate. All the fatalities is on there. You have deaths. I mean, I I, I did a five year report. It's yeah. bad on that interstate. Now you got a lot of we got a lot of traffic coming from all states going to our Virginia Beach. 214 is a favorite exit. So, so if it's a pile up, a lot of folks going to go down 155 to, to Route 60 to get away from that accident. So the roundabout is not going to work when that happens. So you, you're going to have a really pile up, and it happened, and you have people coming out of the community, and if it's 5 o'clock, it's crazy. I, I mean, that roundabout is not going to work, man. So... Uh, thanks uh, for coming out and giving this presentation today. Um, I had a quick question, or actually a comment, or, or question actually for Ron and for VDOT regarding the peanut and the traditional roundabout. The peanut honestly just looks cheaper. It uses less things that you have to do from a de uh, deconstruction perspective. And I was wondering, uh, from a percentage-based perspective, I know VDOT and New Kent County are putting funds towards this. Is, is that right, or is it all VDOT? All VDOT. Okay. Um, is there anything from New Kent County's perspective to want to put more funds towards a permanent solution? Or is this kind of, because I know it's like a five to seven year goal line is what we're looking at. But um, I just didn't know if that was something where New Kent County was also trying to, to push that along. Or is this kind of a wait and see uh, situation um, with regards to the temporariness? I, I think... I don't want to speak for Ron, but I think I'll, I'll speak for Ron. Is, okay, go, go <laughs> I can for speak. it. <laughs> uh, to, that's a very good question. We are not appropriating any funds towards this temporary roundabout. Um, and depending on the time frame, you know, you, you wonder what is the time frame for a roundabout. I don't think it's going to be five to seven years. I think between uh, maybe a year from now after they've installed this 
uh, roundabout, make sure it works. They've tweaked it and it works. And we start looking for other funding for, uh, to make it a permanent one. And I'm, I'm sure Mr. Hathaway is here. I think he would agree with me that, you know, we would look for other funding. There are the other pockets of money. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is Churchill Downs just purchased Colonial Downs. And I believe the final paperwork and sale should be consummated in October, which is not too far away. Uh, and I look for uh, Churchill Downs to come in here and spend some money. And I don't know that to be a fact, you know, but I do look for them to maybe spruce up the area. Um, I'd love to see them put in a hotel, maybe some fine dining and some shops and stuff like that, you know, to have something to do. But don't know for sure, but we can always, you know, check with uh, Churchill Downs once they're here. Yes, is that me or him? I'm also from the Northeast and have coped with New Jersey and Massachusetts and have seen people not ever be able to get into the circle because of the flow of traffic. If you're from New Jersey, are you familiar with the Somerville traffic circle? Yep. It is a yep. nightmare. You cannot get onto the circle because there's too many cars coming around it. And many of the circles there don't have truck traffic. Right now, the truck traffic in Brickshire is terrible. Um, mostly logging trucks, cement trucks, large lumber trucks. I, I just I just see that as a major issue for this traffic circle. I mean, New Jersey is removing their circles, right. and yet Virginia is are. putting them in. Well, I don't get it. And this this is this, I'm sorry. This this is a treatment that's not just being done in Virginia. It's nationally. Roundabouts are very different in, in design and operation than circles. Like the Somerville Circle you mentioned, I think that's uh, 206. So I think it's, two, it's 202, 206, right? <clears throat> so 202, 206 is the main highway through that round, through that circle. It's not a roundabout. So that road always, they never have to yield to anybody unless they're turning. So if you're going straight through on 202, 206, you don't stop and you don't have to stop. Right. <clears throat> but yeah, when so with the circle, with the circle, the main road never had to yield right of way to anybody. Right. But with, 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 so with something like this, and again, this is not gonna see the kind of volume, at least in the near term, that Somerville Circle would, but all traffic has to yield to the people who are in the roundabout, the circulating lane. So it's no one has right of way, um, no one has a, a, a priority on the approaches. All the approaches are treated the same in this in this design. I have a question uh, about 155, not related to the roundabout here, but uh, I appreciate all the paving that's been done down at 155 to widen it a little bit, and I think it a lot smoother ride down down toward Providence Forge. I do have some concerns, and I wanted to ask: Are there any plans to install guardrails? Or there are steep drop-offs right at the edge of the road near the Jasmine Inn. Uh, those dro those drop-offs are anywhere from like six to eight feet, and I can see some somebody at night going right off there, and a number of accidents happening if you don't put some guardrails up there. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing was uh, with this: Are there plans with all those ditches along 155 down there, uh, especially in conjunction with the uh, Dominion Energy Plan that I don't know any details about other than what we got in the mail with a map uh, all the way up 155. Are there plans to install underground electrical lines and those ditches would be a perfect place for them while well, they're already dug up? Just a question, but I'm, I'm concerned about the guardrails on a safety standpoint. Yeah, th those are both good questions. I think um, the short answer to the guardrail is, is I don't think that there's any guardrail installation associated with that project, but we can definitely look at the, uh, the, the spots you were talking about and see if, um, you know, guardrail is warranted or if there's, uh, yeah. Yeah. sure. If you're not going to put guardrails, at least put a outer line where the edge of the pavement is. 
Yeah. So, so that is that has not been installed yet. The the center line on 155 has been installed. The edge lines have not been installed yet. That is still yet to be completed. And and I will say this about guardrail is it it does become a hazard when it is within the the, the right of way and within the clear zone. Um, you know, one thing that we we do like to use um, when guardrail maybe doesn't make the most sense is not not these but some type of delineator that delineates the edge, the drop off, um, it shines in, in a, a headlight. Uh, so, but we can definitely look at that. As far as the Dominion Energy, I apologize. I am not, I'm not familiar with the project, <laughs> um, but we can definitely see what we can do to become familiar with the project. Um, but I apologize, I can't, I can't speak to that. Sir. Uh, er No. Yeah, please do. So er earlier you said that a traditional roundabout, roundabout has 12 contact points and the peanut has eight. Is that right? So I, I probably did say that. That is not particularly accurate. So I will, I will circle back, but I'll let you finish. Okay. So what is the difference? What's... Actually, what is it? So, you know, this is, I apologize. This is a traditional roundabout. There is no slip lanes. Okay. So the, so the difference, sorry to cut you off. The difference between the slip lanes and the peanut without the slip lanes is four contact points. Correct. Correct. So how many, how many crashes does a contact point equate to? And does that outweigh the benefit of having a slip lane? Right. So a conflict point is, it really doesn't equate to a specific number of crashes. It's just once the more conflict points you have, the greater potential for crashes. I get that. But theoretically, you would have data that a traditional intersection or this many contact points generally equates to roughly this many number of crashes, which is why your whole point is you want to reduce contact points, right? So you want to minimize the number of crashes. But is four contact points, does that outweigh the benefit of having the slip lanes? Because the slip lanes coming out of the neighborhood or going into Chesapeake Circle or coming into the neighborhood uh, north, going northbound on 155, that, that's critical. I mean, and that's, to me, that really maintains traffic. And I think we'd all like to know, or at least I would, what, what are we getting with four contact points? Sure. I, I think so. It's less that we want to eliminate the conflict points. It's more so we want we want to reduce the decisions that you would have to make as a motorist. It's really crashes occur when people are not sure on what they're doing. So you eliminate that decision making and you force people to go in one direction. And it's just one less thing a motorist has to think about. So that that's really what we're what we're proposing with the peanut and removing those conflict points um, to, to add a, to put a number on each conflict point. I, I don't think we can do that. I definitely can't do that now. Um, sure. But you would still have a roundabout where crashes are at low speeds, right? There's both so, so you're lower still having, lower impact the, you're, you're still having low impact, low velocity <clears throat> crashes that are going to exist, whether people have to make a decision or not. Right. So if you have the benefit of having the roundabout where you're going to increase the production of traffic, it seems to me that there's room, which you've shown that there is room to maintain the slip lanes, which is a huge bonus for anybody coming out of the neighborhood or turning into Chesapeake Surf. That's all. Appreciate that. So I'm going to I'm going to go through some of the comments that came in um, over the computer. Uh, the first one was, please explain why it, why it will take up to five years for a traditional roundabout. Um, so to answer that question, we consider uh, a standard VDOT project, standard construction project to be three phases. The first one is, is preliminary engineering, where we you know, kick off the project and we start the design um, phase two is the utility portion where you, um, utilities and right of way, we would purchase any right of way needed 
to um, expand the roadway prism um, and the right of way. We would also move utilities that may be in conflict. So maybe that's a Dominion power line or maybe that's uh, a gas line, but that, that part happens prior to construction. And then the last part is actually the, the construction phase. Um, so there's a lot of moving parts, uh, but that is traditionally um, what a, what a three phase project takes is somewhere around five, you know, four to six years. Um, now, could this be done faster? Very potentially it could be, um, but I don't think we're at a place here where we can commit to saying this, this permanent roundabout would be built in, in three years. I think that would not be doing anybody, um, any justice. So, uh, number, the next question was why are bollards a better temporary solution over the Chesterfield portable solution? What I think that means is why are we using these things versus that in Chesterfield? The simple answer is this product is in very, very high demand. It's difficult to get. And it is, I think, four times as expensive as it was when this project was done. So um, it becomes more and more and more expensive. Uh, and we want, we want to do this now. Uh, we want to do it, like I said, this fall. Um, so this is the way that we can do it fastest and within the budget that we have. And if I could also add to that, this roundabout, that those, um, the, the yellow and the black pieces you see out there, each one, there's a bunch of small, um, to, essentially it's a jigsaw puzzle. So there's a bunch of pieces that are bolted down to the road to make these, these features. So each one of those has to be manufactured um, uh, uniquely to be able to fit these designs. So this, this is an off the shelf product and can be deployed a lot faster. Next question was, will semi trucks be able to maneuver safely within um, the truck apron? The answer is yes, that that is, that is part of our design. Um, one of our critical elements was to look at uh, the, a tractor trailer, but also a horse trailer um, and making sure that the, the shape and the dimensions of the roundabout can, can be navigated um, with those, those vehicles. And then the last two questions were about bike and pedestrians, and I'm gonna let Rob take that one. And this is why I've asked to put, um, put this, bring this, <clears throat> bring this figure back up. Um, this shows pedestrians um, can be accommodated roundabouts, typically on the approach prior to entering the roundabout. So if there is a need for pedestrian facilities, they can be designed in on these approaches um, with appropriate, um, in, in, in a place where they're more visible to oncoming traffic um, and provide the connectivity throughout the roundabout to make all the, all the necessary movements. Um, I think connectivity is key part. I don't, I don't know, I don't think that there's any sidewalk connectors at these, the four quadrants um, at Kentland Trail and 155, but, but absolutely, if there was a, a sidewalk network, then we could, we could very easily connect to that. Um, you know, we're not proposing to do that at this intersection simply because there's not, a, there's not anywhere for people to come from or go as far as sidewalks. Oh, we got a few more. <laughs> I'm just curious. It sounds like we're going to be doing a roundabout regardless of what we feel here in the community. I'm getting that opinion. Okay. I didn't think we actually had an issue on 155 and Kenland Trail, to be honest with you. I see eight crashes in four years, only one serious. I don't even see that as an issue. But if we're forced to have a roundabout, I would like, like this gentleman says, to have slip lanes because we're two lanes coming out of here and I just, I mean, I'd like to see you at least get that option. Sure. I, I, I know you're saying you're going to have four more points of contact, but at least give us that option because we have it now. So I, what I'll say is that our, we're not considering this done. Um, you know, that's why we wanted to have this meeting and we are going to, circle back up as a, as a team, as a VDOT team, but also as a team with, with the county, um, debrief and, and, and see how we're gonna move forward. So I, I don't wanna say that this is, a, uh, this is a done deal, it's not, so.
since we've segwayed from uh, the roundabout, I'd like to follow up on the gentleman's question over there. Is there, if you'll be so kind, is there anything in the consideration for the resurfacing of the length of Kenland Trail? Because actually, it's beginning to look like my grandmother's patchwork quilt. Fair. Um, we can definitely look and see where Kenland Trail is on the resurfacing schedule. I don't have that in front of me right now, and I apologize. I should have definitely come with this resurfacing schedule. Um, uh, if I could please, it. I personally requested repaving Kentland Trail from uh, court, Courthouse Road to Brickshire, and I requested that two years ago. Uh, I have not gotten a final answer yet, but we're hoping to see some funding for next year. No definite answer yet, but we're on it. Just know we're on it, okay? Once every 50 years. <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't know. Um, well, I think ideally we'd, we'd like to touch every road within every 10 years. Um, that, that would be I, un, un, understood. So we do uh, an extensive review of roads throughout the um, within the district uh, and we do pavement rise and reviews and then we grade the pavement, and then we prioritize which roads need to be um, resurfaced. So, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm not super well-versed in what has been done with Kentland Trail, but I know that we have looked at it, and, and like Mr. Steer said, I think we have submitted it um, to, be, to be resurfaced, um, and we can definitely push on that, I think. So. I want to come up to the screen. Can you back up to the circle with the slip roads for me? I want to make a point about the slip roads, something I've seen regularly here. All right, so that's perfect. So what we have right now, we have traffic comes this way and it comes this way. I have seen people coming from both directions that will go into both lanes. I see no reason if we have the slip roads that we won't see exactly the same thing. <coughs> um, the people coming into Brickshire, um, a lot of our residents, a lot of people going over to the uh, racetrack, they don't know where to go. They are going to double across both these lanes. So if we have these slip roads, these slip lanes, I think it's going to be more of a, uh, a lot more um, problematic than just losing the um, um, capacity. Does that make sense? No, it does. Just a point, thank you. Um, who wants to comment on widening 64? I'm not, I'm not touching that one. <laughs> okay. It's he'll touch that one. <laughs> All right, here we go. Sorry. We are moving forward with widening I-64. Um, basically the, if you've heard the secretary of transportation, he refers to it as the straw, basically from 205 down to 234. We're moving forward with that. The West end of that project will be the first one to go. And that will be going out by the end of this year. We'll start the procurement process for the design and construction. Uh, with first phase will be from exit 205 down to about mile marker 212. We'll go past 211. Uh, the next phase after that will be on the east end. We'll start on the uh, 234 and start working back towards the new Kent County line. And then the last phase will be the one in the middle basically from 212, 212 down to the line. So, but, but the schedule for the entire thing is, is we're looking to have the entire project completed uh, in calendar year 2028. So that's the entire, that sounds like a long time, but we're almost in 23. So that's um, 20 some miles of interstate, both east and west, that'll be widened. The bridges on the interstate will be widened and repaired to accommodate that. So it's, it's a lot of work to do. It's um, somewhere in the neighborhood of $750 million worth of work. So that's where we're at on 64. It's moving, moving forward thanks to our General Assembly who uh, used some of the excess taxes, I'll leave it at that, um, to uh, give us uh, $470 million towards that, that amount. So. Well, that's good news. I would like to thank you for finally getting around to putting a roundabout down here. I think it's great. I drive down 
249 regularly through both roundabouts. So I get to play with both of them, uh, familiar with them. And I think it's going to work great. I think that the, the simple one, the peanut one that you said with just a single way around without the turn lanes would be the most simple, uncomplicated way to go. But a question is, you said you're going to start with barrels first, but which design are you going to throw out there in 30 days? What are we going to throw out in 30 days? Yeah. Which are you going to do a peanut so, or yeah. the traditional? Yes. Yes. We are going to, well, I say our plan is to start with the peanut. Like I said, nothing is set in stone with this. Uh, our group is going to go back and debrief and we're in debrief with New Kent. But um, the plan that, that I'm presenting today is to, is to set up that peanut style roundabout um, as soon as we pave. Okay. Because whatever design you don't use, can you put it down here at Rosie's at the entrance there before somebody gets killed from our neighborhood? That's a, that's a Ron Steers question. Uh, like I said, uh, let's see what happens when Churchill Downs comes to town. Okay. All right, any other questions? Uh, I want to thank all of you. Thank all the VDOT superintendents, um, uh, Mr. Hathaway, our IT department. Um, thank, thank all of you for coming out tonight. Like I said, when VDOT first announced they wanted to install a roundabout, I said, let's take it to the people and let the residents of Brickshire at least be aware, have some voice in it. Not everybody's going to be happy, you know? But I think as long as we work towards the goal of making it a safer intersection, you know, that's what we're after. So I want to thank all of you for coming tonight. Um, thanks for your input, some very great questions. And uh, just and thanks again to the Brickshaw HOA for letting us use the owner's clubhouse for the meeting. So thank you all. This is a totally separate item, so what you're here for, but I just want to try and explain something.